So hello, I'm uh, here to uh, have a discussion with Tony Young, who's the National Clinical Lead for, N for Innovation at NHS England. Um, and uh, here we are at, 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 at Risk Minds, and obviously there's a, uh, you're here to, uh, I think, you're speaking today, and you're also here to, I think, uh, understand and for us to learn from you around the, the how your work, you know, both in, in, in that role and as a, as a, as, as a clinical surgeon, uh, interacts with what we do in the, in the insurance industry. And, and, and also, I mean, you're, you're heavily involved in the Angela Ruskin, uh, and we're a co-founder of, of that, uh, that, that, that MedTech campus. And, and so, in terms of innovation, do you think there's things that, that you do that we can, we can learn from in, in the insurance industry? Sure, I think I think there have been there are lots of things that I've seen um, uh, going on. I've been here um, uh, since yesterday, meeting a sort of a broad range of, right. uh, of different people um, who are both sort of providers of insurance services and reinsurance and other things. Yeah. And I've been struck by the common problems right. that we're facing in healthcare, which we have one of the largest and longest established healthcare organisations mm. in history in the National Health Service. Um, the global healthcare industry, I think, is worth about seven trillion dollars, and the global insurance industry, I believe, about three. So we've both got very large global markets, both who perhaps haven't kept up with the rate of change and pace of change that has advanced in technology and the other way things have done. So one of the figures that sometimes surprises me the most, I believe, it's still true to say, that the National Health Service is the largest purchaser of fax machines on the planet right. still. Right. Um, now we've got a vision and a strategy to replace that and move completely digital within the next couple of years. But it shows you how long in a large system it can take to replace some yes. innovate. So sometimes we need to de-innovate. We need to get rid of those things that worked well for us once and served us well and bring in the latest, greatest things. And from things I've been hearing in the insurance industry, mm. you face some similar problems. People have been bemoaning Excel mm -hmm. and how everyone yeah. uses um, Excel spreadsheets and actually they're very comfortable with that. But there may be better tools you can use now that yes. you can move to. So I think there have been some real similarities. There have been some pain points which you're facing in the insurance industry, which we're also facing in healthcare, issues around people living longer lives with uh, more chronic diseases, and, and how can we keep them living longer, happier, healthier lives in their homes, yeah. and keep them more empowered, and keep them out of hospitals. That's definitely the direction we want to move in. Far better to have your long-term condition managed at home or in a community setting, um, and keep hospitals and acute care for when people really need to be admitted. Yeah. Um, yep. And also, so I've, uh, it's been a fascinating opportunity to meet different people with different different insights, different problems, but realise that there are lots of common themes going on, and lots of things I've seen happening. You have a real startup sector in sort of insurance technologies and things coming out. Yep. And five, ten years ago, that wasn't there in many sectors, and in healthcare, that's become a real growing area now. Of are the latest, greatest things coming out of our hospitals and universities? and some of them are, mm. but increasingly we're seeing that coming from industry. So companies now are increasingly disrupting our lives and, and the way we lead them. So whether it's Microsoft or Google or Apple or yes. Uber or Airbnb, those are things that are coming in and making a difference to everyone's lives yep. and we're using their services. So what can we learn from what's being done in the commercial world mm. and learn those lessons and transfer it through into healthcare? Because if we're truly going to transform our industry, we need to embrace those learnings. And I think the same is probably true yes. for the insurance industry as well. Yeah. And, and from what I've seen, people here are recognizing that and doing something about yeah. it. And you've talked about, I think, you know, the, the example you gave of, of, of fax machines in, in the energy, you talked about an innovation strategy there mm -hmm. that you're using to, 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 replace, mm -hmm. to replace those. What are the most successful innovation strategies and how do you approach innovation from a strategic perspective that you think we can, well, we can apply in other industries? We had a new chief executive come in around two years ago, and uh, Simon Stevens, and when he first came in, he sat down with all the thought leaders and people in the centre of NHS England, and within six months, the NHS had come out with a vision, a new view that was quite bold and quite radical. So before you can enact your strategy into place, yes. we had to have that vision at the core. And it was quite a uh, hard-hitting, plain-speaking vision of we need to get serious about prevention. No longer can we just say, 
um, you need to be healthier. We had in, in the United Kingdom, we had the Wanderlust report more than a decade ago, which mm. told us that we needed to be serious about prevention, and yet we didn't really follow through on the recommendations of that. Well, now the five-year forward view says we don't have the luxury of being able to wait anymore. And our chief executive has been very bold and very frank in some of the things he's yes. saying. Uh, one of the statements that's uh, uh, been said is that obesity is set to become the new cancer. Mm. And, and, and what we mean by that is that more people in the United Kingdom will soon die from obesity-related causes than they do from cancer. So this is an entirely preventable disease. Yes. And, and how can we get serious about that? And you will have seen some announcements recently in the budget last week yep. around a sugar tax and other things. And I think you're going to see increasingly working between uh, Public Health England and NHS England and other stakeholders mm. in our communities to say, actually, we need to get a grip on this. We can't just let this carry on happening. So I think the, the, the figures go that um, it's going to be multiple billions of pounds are going to be piled on future tax. So the nation's piling sort of uh, pounds on our waistline and we're putting billions of pounds in future taxes that our whole population is going to have to pay for a disease that is entirely preventable, yeah, 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 which yes, is obesity. Yes, yes. So yes. we have to be straight, very straight talking about that, I think. So not only did he set the vision for prevention, it was around new models of care. Mm. So what served us really well 70 years, nearly 70 years ago when the National Health Service was set up, does it serve us as well now as it did back then? So we had a health system designed on them. Um, uh, acute illnesses, people, infectious diseases would kill people very young. Well, now we vaccinate against many of those, so yeah. life expectancy has increased. Cancer, heart disease, strokes, all areas where we've made quite large inroads over yes. the last 50, 70 years or so. But now 70% of our healthcare budget is spent on chronic diseases. Yeah. So yeah. do we need so many acute care hospitals? I think the figures in the United States have been perhaps there are twice as many hospital acute care beds mm. than are actually needed. And how can we move to a model where people are managed closer to home and empowered to manage their own conditions? So we've designed new models of care, looking at smart care homes, working more between primary and secondary care, um, reimagining urgent care and how we take that forward. And we've set up more than 50 vanguard areas, they're called in the United Kingdom. They, these are our great hope. These are the pioneering places that are going to look to how we can be disruptive, how we can deliver those yeah. new models of care moving forward. And then lastly, in the vision that the five year forward view set out was looking on efficiency. How can we still maintain um, high quality mm. universal healthcare free at the point of delivery mm. Um, for all in an affordable and sustainable way. Mm. And I think the statistics um, show that um, pound for pound, the National Health Service in England is still the most efficient um, uh, healthcare system and high quality healthcare system on the planet for the money that we spend. Yes. But actually we're facing so many new challenges and things. So we have to innovate. We so we, we can change all those things, we can impact public health, new models of care, and we can make efficiency savings, but is that going to deliver the, mm. the personalised care, uh, the personalised medicine agenda, what I would call the democratisation of healthcare, so empowering patients and, and citizens who are already healthy? Why do we have to wait for people to yes. become sick? We have a sickness model of care. Can't we have a wellness model of care yes. where people who aren't yet in the system can actually be encouraged to uh, maintain their health and, and stay healthy and happier for longer. So once you have a vision, and um, that radical vision has been set out for the NHS now, I think we can then put the strategy building blocks in place. Yeah. And um, uh, we've announced a number of those from a national innovation accelerator to test beds to healthy new towns. Recently, we've launched a clinical entrepreneur training program mm. because we've recognized that actually all the latest, greatest things aren't necessarily coming out of our hospitals and universities, but if we're not teaching our clinicians, and that's not just doctors, it's nurses, allied healthcare practitioners, clinical scientists and pharmacists, but stepping beyond those actually, it's patients too. Why shouldn't mm. we have patients and citizens involved in reimagining what yeah. healthcare should look yeah. like and have them involved right from the outset? So we've uh, launched a program recently that I've been involved with, with Sir Bruce Keir, our National Medical Director, looking at how can we equip our clinicians in the first instance with the skills, the knowledge, mm. the experience you can learn from the commercial mm. sector mm. and bring that back into the National Health Service to say, how can we transform the models of healthcare that we're delivering? Right.
yet. So on right. strategy, I think lots of programs that are building blocks that are going to, so in IT, we're looking to be paperless. Well, I can't remember if it's the end of 2017 or 2018, we've made the commitment to do this. So those fax machines will yeah, be yeah, gone, yeah, yeah, yeah. and we're moving to those things, yeah. and digitalizing the whole of the healthcare record. Yeah. You know, we have a tremendous opportunity, you know, the largest and longest established healthcare system in the history of our planet. Mm. So it's not easy to change, not difficult to change, but I think with the right leadership, which we have in place now, and the willing to make those changes and drive them forward, mm. I think we've got a real chance at being very innovative and, and delivering the healthcare for the future of our population. And I think it will be a model that the rest of the world are going to uh, learn lots from. Yeah, and I think one, just one final question, if I may, which is, I think you referred to at the at the, at the end there the long-standing tradition of the National Health Service and the fact that you know that the, you you have to move it but also treat it with with care in a way in, in itself as a body as an organisation and I, I guess that relates to the the point around uh, insurance is also a long-standing tradition with its own cultures and its own uh, ways of practice and its own um, I guess gurus in a way. Does does culture what what part does culture play in in this and can it can it help innovation or is it sometimes a barrier or block to innovation and how can you harness culture in a good way? So when people um, so you're absolutely right they're like two big super tankers aren't they the National Health Service and the insurance industry that people see as on a course and difficult to turn around and that if I was to give a one word answer to the solution to how we're going to do that it's culture. Mm. The culture in, in our organisations and in what we do and how we encourage them and how we free up our front line in the National Health Service to start delivering that change is so important. And I think we have put a number of those cultural building blocks in place that we're taking forward. Um, to give you an example, academic health science networks have been established, yeah. which are a collaboration between our universities, between industry and between clinicians and healthcare providers to say, can we create an open innovation platform where we can all stand, instead of being on other sides of the fence and industry trying to sell products into healthcare and healthcare trying to deliver mm. um, uh, you know, better health for our populations as well, how about we all stand on the same platform broadcasting what the problems, what the pain points are, and then talking about what the solutions might be that we could come up yes. to address those pain points. And from what I've seen here at Risks Mind so far in the last couple of days, is it, it's very similar. There is that collaboration between the startups, between industry and the big players, and the thinkers and thought leaders saying, how could we imagine things differently? How can we bring the best of technology mm. through to mm. help make that happen? So I think there are a number of key features that we've put in place that are going to help us in that innovation culture. Giving, giving people permission sometimes is the most valuable thing they can do. I mean, I'm sure in the insurance industry, a company would say our workforce are empowered to innovate, yeah. but actually, what happens if things go wrong mm. and they don't go so well? How do we tolerate failure? Yeah. So failure, in my view, is when you don't learn from when things didn't go right. Yeah. So, but actually we have to have a culture and allow a culture where negative results are acceptable yes. and we learn from them as long as, long as they're done in a risk managed way and in a yep. safe way, particularly with patients. We wouldn't want to take you know, risks that are inappropriate or not right, but we still have to allow our staff to be able to learn from um, thing, when things go wrong and then make the improvements mm. and put them in place. But we have to do that in a culture where it doesn't mean that um, a, a, a negative result ends up in uh, you know, some sanction yeah. um, that's going to discourage people from taking those risks yep. because it's by taking the risks. And we see that lots in industry, don't we? Some who the smallest, most innovative companies and startups mm. sometimes take the biggest risk because of the nature they have to, yeah. and they then go ahead and, and disrupt and some of the major yes. industries and, and major players. And we've seen that time and again across different things. So I think in the NHS now, we've got the right leadership, we've got um, uh, the right vision, we're putting the strategy in place to uh, go and deliver on that. And, and you know, with the government as well, um, uh, our uh, George Freeman, our life sciences minister, has set out his accelerated access review, saying, it's not good enough just to continue the way we're going on. We want the latest, greatest things taken up. So right from the top of government, um, right down to the front line of the NHS, I think we're now developing a culture that um, it's not perfect. Mm. We've not got all the mm. way here, th mm. there yet, but what you've got the leaders at the top saying is, we want this to happen and we want to empower our front. We have one point, I think it's 1.3, 1.4 million employees in the National Health Service. I think we're the fourth or fifth largest employer on the planet. Yeah. 
wow, what a task it is to incentivize and encourage that population yeah. to be innovative yeah. um, and to do that in a safe and appropriate manner. And um, so I think we put lots of things in place. It's not easy or straightforward. Yeah, I think you have to find partners. And excellence through partnership is going to be key. So working with health insurers and the health insurance industry. So, you know, how is it you can look at uh, longevity issues, you know, um, uh, from an insurance perspective, uh, life insurance and those sorts of things, would be much better if no one died young. Mm. So you guys never had to pay out. And that would be fantastic, yeah. wouldn't it? Because yeah. we'd have a population that all lives to a good, healthy age. Um, how can we make inroads in that? How can so are there areas where the insurance industry and uh, the National Health Service and public sector can work together on core um, pain points, core aims that we have to deliver those? Mm. So all sorts of things you yeah. can do in this area. Yeah. Excellent, fascinating discussion. Thanks very much, Tony. Okay, Thank thanks. You. Bye.